Um, thank you very much, Wallace, and, and thank you all for being here. I, I want to thank the whole group, especially uh, those that had anything with um, bringing this on, on to you without your knowledge or anything, um, inviting me back. I was, um, I was thinking about that, um, that uh, the number of places that um, I have been and, 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 and where I got invited back to and, and, and the ones I have not. I, I was a um, sort of a grandiose drinker that when I was drinking on my expense account, I had lots of money. Now, I clarify that, on my expense account, and I would tip very well. And um, I, I would do that for a number of reasons. One, I was just hoping you'd um, keep the drinks coming and, and so forth and, and hope to make an impression on you and, and maybe invite me out uh, some other time. But when I gave up drinking, and I, and I, I clarify that, I didn't give up drinking. When, when drinking got forced out of my um, realm of doing things, um, I didn't get a single call. And, and to this day, a little over, almost over 26 years, not a single one of those places has called me and said, Paige, uh, you know, I was spending thousands of dollars with them, and not one of them had called back. Well, where are you? When are you coming back? And, and we miss you and, and all that. And I, I don't, I, and I don't know. I don't know if they're still doing well or not. Anyway, I do know that um, if I miss my home group, I get a call, and and um, and, and I'm I'm glad of that. But um, again, thank you for this privilege to be here. I'm Paige Wood. I'm an alcoholic. And my sobriety birth date is March the 31st, 1989. And I'm a member of the Came to Believe group in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We're one group that meets twice a week. I'm gonna take a moment and tell you all about this home group in, in, in hopes that you will settle down and, and get comfortable. And I'll start my talk after that. You guys gotta lighten up. What this is about is to get me to settle down, you know, and, and so forth. So anyway, remember the King to Bleed group, this one group that meets twice a week. We meet on Tuesdays and Fridays, and, and we're a big book study group. By the way, I brought this book in, in case I, um, I just give out, uh, I'll just read to you. I know for a fact it's a, it, it's a good book, and, and it, it won't hurt any of us. So uh, I carry the book, and, and it gives me a sense of... Um, it gives me a sense of power that, that, that God has shared from him through here, through the men in, in AA, and, and the same sense of power, that misguided sense of power that I got from drinking booze. And I was one of those guys that, um, I sponsor people that say that they, um, they didn't drink in the mornings or they didn't drink on you know, certain days of the week. And, and, and I would say, how sad, you know, that you, <laughs> that you miss those occasions and, 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 and so forth. And, uh, but I was a guy that never gave out a booze. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, when I was forced to quit drinking, I was just thinking about meeting Wallace and, and Tom and some others uh, 26 years ago, to be a fact in fact. Uh, I was 90 days sober at the first international in, in, in Seattle, Washington. And um, so uh, when I began to uh, meet the men who have influenced and, and mentored me, and some of them have sponsored me uh, through the years. And so I've just been um, overpaid in, 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 in that area of my life, in every area of my life. And um, when I say that around work, um, like somebody say, how you doing, Paige? And I say, well, I'm overpaid. And, and then I'll say, overpaid in every area of my life, uh, financially. And I'll throw that out there. And they say, well, they sure are. We know you are, you know. <laughs> and I am. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't have the career that I have and, 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 and shouldn't be in the position that I have and so forth But because I'm overpaid. And, uh, and, and I got that by grace and, and, and mercy. And I, I stole most of the, the credit to even get there in, in the early days of drinking. I'm trying to wrap this thing up about my group, and, and I'm just getting a little off on it. Anyway, we meet uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, and we study this book, the textbook. It takes us about two years to do this. I understand that we had one of our girls down here a couple weeks ago. Didn't we have Amy down here recently, um, Wallace? Amy, was she down here recently? Yeah. yeah well, anyway, she would have told you this whole thing because that's how we're trained to do We, we um, we, we want you to come visit our group, so we tell you about our group. When I tell you about our group, what I'm trying to do is to let you know how important the home group is to me and to my life, and without it, one of the, that's one of the things that, I, that, that makes me be here tonight is 
I've always had a home group. I've always had a sponsor. I've always looked up to men in AA, and, and, and that has guided me to, to find that very elusive relationship with God. And then, and then they're the ones that taught me how to be, how to be the employee and let God be the employer. And so I've, I've learned that through sponsorship and, and through um, the men in AA. Some help from the ladies as well. Yeah, probably as much. <laughs> in any case, so it takes us a couple of years to study this book, and, and that's just how we do it. And, and um, we, I, I do know that we argue about that in our group because everybody will say it takes two years and three months and some weeks. And I can remember before they were members, we would do this book in about a year. But they say two years, and then I go along with it. We also study the traditions, uh, one a month, and, and so in the course of one year, we get through all 12 of them, and, and we do that. And then on Fridays, we, we study conference of fruit literature, and, uh, and pick a topic and talk about it. And once a month, the last Friday of every month, and, and that's why I would you know, in, invite you to come, I don't want you to miss your home group to come to mine. Uh, but t the last Friday of the month shouldn't hurt you. We have world-class refreshments at 6 o'clock, and a great speaker goes on at 7, and he can stay as long as he wants. And, and, uh, and sometimes people like Tom and Wallace stay pretty long. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have that the last Friday of the, of the month, and we have just one speaker a month, uh, very much like you have this format here. So, listen, I'm the, um, I'll get started here if I can. I'm, the, I'm, I'm obviously the, the last man that should be here behind this podium in, in the church on a Thursday night in Southern Pines uh, and, and, and a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, and the reason I tell you that is when I was growing up, you had to have some exposure. You, something had to stop us from drinking. Obviously, we're going to talk about that. But something had to start you to drink. And I had absolutely no reason to start. In fact, I had every reason not to. I grew up in a family that was, um, to say it was riddled with alcoholism would just would, would, leave, would leave somebody out. My father, my grandfather, and, and my great-grandfather, my father had five brothers, and, 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 and some, of the, some of the other people in the family that were all alcoholic. And in my own family, uh, I got a uh, brother that's uh, an alcoholic, and, and myself, and our three sisters. We don't know what happened to them. They, 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 you know, they married one man. They went to one college. Uh, they got one degree. They, they've been married forever to, to the, same, the same man. And so we can't, we, my brother and myself don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> so we, we've done none of that, you know. Um, uh, multiple wives, multiple schools, take, you know, 12 years to get a four-year degree and those kind of things. <laughs> Drinking has a lot to do with that. But anyway, when I was growing up, my father was just a, just a terrible alcoholic. And, and we don't talk about it much. I don't hear it much in alcoholics anymore about a bender drinker. That is a man or woman that would drink very hard for, for uh, a week, two weeks, six weeks or something. And, and, then, and then could go a year or more and not drink. And, and my father was one of those drinkers and one of those men. He was actually also the original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. My father was well respected, held political office, made a lot of money, had a good degree in, in, from college, got a degree from Carolina when during the depression. That's, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, and, and things like that. But when he drank, he became um, he became, he just became awful, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it and move on. My father would go off and take all the money and, and go off and be gone as long as six months at a time, and our family would go from, from being okay to being without power, sometimes for months at a time, and, uh, and one of us kids would have to go next door to boil a bucket of water. Uh, we, did, we didn't have any utilities and, and anything. And, and men from AA, um, Wallace mentioned that I sponsor somebody, I, some, some guys, I sponsor a lot of guys and I love it and it, and it gives me life. Uh, but but I, when I compare what I do to help a man or a woman 
Uh, it is nothing, it, it, it is nothing compared to the two men that helped my father. My father would, would go off and be gone, nobody would know where he is. Those two old men would drive 18 miles from another town, come to my mom's home on a Saturday morning with two big bags, paper bags of groceries. They would bring groceries that they either paid for or their group paid for, and they brought them. And we would not have had food otherwise. And they always brought a little bit of coffee, and my mom would jump up and make coffee, and they'd sit and talk for hours. And, 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 and it was just amazing. And I, when I think back on, on what they tried to do for my father, and when I, when I recognize and give them the credit for what they did for our family, it's just amazing. See, and the only thing I can think about it that even comes close is in the book. There's a story in here that talks about um, uh, uh, a guy from Akron got with, with Dr. Smith on his day off. And, and I sponsor a doctor, so I, I, I use this as an example a lot also. Uh, so when, when the guy I sponsor has a day off, he goes to the country club and he plays golf. Or depending on what season it is, he goes down to Oriental and gets on his sailboat and messes around. He's got money, obviously, and so forth. When Dr. Bob had his day off, he got with this guy that's in the book, and he took him through the steps one afternoon, one afternoon, and took him through all the steps. And when, when it came to the character defects and the shortcomings, he, Dr. Bob, told him what his shortcomings was. He didn't even ask him. He said, these are your shortcomings. Do you want them removed? And the man said, yeah, absolutely I do. He said, well, let's pray about it. And both of them got down on the floor. This is the doctor on his, on his day off working with an alcoholic. So they got down on the floor and they, they prayed together for those character defects to be removed. And then they went on through the steps. Well, when I think about that, that it, it just, I almost want to cry. And I'm not going to cry here tonight and everything. I'm going to cry a little bit on the inside. I'm just so, so moved by that. And, and, so, and so when I think about I get that call to go help somebody, and I say, well, dang, I don't want to go. Let me call somebody else and get them to go and, and, and do things like that. And I, you know, you know, I want to be taken out and shot. That's the kind of way I feel about it. Anyway, so these men would, would come over and visit my mom and everything. My dad would be gone, and we wouldn't have utilities or anything. But when my father would come home, being without the utilities was the good part. That was the good times in our life. When my father would come home, he'd come in, and he'd be restless, irritable, and discontent. He'd be ashamed. He'd feel guilt and, and, and remorse for, for what has happened. He's out of money now, and he's out of everything, so he, he, he got forced back home. And he came home with all those things, those adjectives that, that, that we learn in the big book. Shame and remorse and guilt and, and, and that kind of stuff. And he would take it out on, on the family. He beat my mom. My mom was a little girl, little woman. And he beat her right to the floor. And then he'd go to my sisters and he'd beat them. He'd go to my big brother. And then to me, I'd be the last because I was the baby and, and, and I ran faster. Uh, he, would, he, would, he would beat us all. And my mom, oh, and then he would like go off in the corner of the room, pee, pass out, and, and, and that would be it. My mom would, would get up and fix herself, whatever was hurt or broken, go to the girls in, in the order they got their whip beatings and so forth, and to my brother and to myself, and she'd fix us. She would clean up the mess in the corner. She'd get him off the bed. She'd straighten up and everything around that. And the next morning, she'd have us all at the kitchen table. Might not be anything there to eat or it'd be very meager meal. And we'd sit there. Now, all of us was on one side of that table. He's on the other side because we're scared to death of him, of course. And, 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 but nobody ever explained that to us. So anyway, that's, that's my view of drinking and why I shouldn't be here. I never, ever wanted anything to do that, that would affect a man the way my father was affected. I, I was a Boy Scout back then. That's the, I think that's the Boy Scout oath, and, and, and it is, trust me on that. And I would say, Mother, I swear my Boy Scout oath that I will never, ever drink. 
I will never ever treat a woman the way our father has. I will never ever treat a family the way our father has. I just never do that. And my mom would just hug, hug me and kiss me and cry and say, I sure hope so, son, and all that kind of thing. I don't know how long it was but between me saying that to her and meaning it just like I mean tonight. I'm going to leave here, say, uh, talk to some friends and so forth, and leave here and go home. I'm going straight home without passing go. I, I, you know, I want to get home. I've been traveling a lot the last month, and I, I'm looking forward to getting home. And um, in fact, this is my last, last official act before the, uh, the holiday starts. And so I'm going to go home. And I mean that. So I meant, I meant that I'm not going to drink just as positively. And, and, and sometime later, uh, when my time came to drink, I was as powerless over that first drink as I would be tonight over the next one, if there was one. And, and so forth, if I, if I hadn't have done what you've taught me to do. And so when my time came, uh, four of us were camping out uh, one summer, summer evening, and um, we got enough money together to buy a six-pack of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Now, we didn't ask for that brand. I don't know that we even knew a brand. We asked a, a man, an older man, to buy us kids. We were, we were 13 and 14 years old. I was 13. And, uh, and he did, he went, and we said we want a pack of cigarettes also. And so he bought us a pack of cigarettes and, uh, and came back with all that. And um, back then, cans of beer were in real strong metal, and you had to have an opener for them. And they were called, of all things, a church key uh, that, that you would open a can of beer with. They didn't have pop tops back then. And so he did bring us one of those. We didn't even know what they were. We didn't know how to get into them. We got into the beer. We got a screwdriver and a hammer, and we beat, we, we beat those cans all to all the pieces, but we got in them. And, uh, but well, I'll tell you what we, we did know. We did know that we wanted a non-filtered, little short camel or lucky cigarette. We wanted to, to be like the cowboys and, and, and the real men. We wanted that non-filtered little cigarette and, and when you smoke non-filtered cigarettes, I don't know if any of you have, um, smoke is not as popular as it used to be, is it, Wallace? Anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'm, an, I'm an expert smoker too now. So anyway, um, you get a little bit of tobacco on, on your tongue and you'd have to spit, you'd go like that and, and, and spit that little straight shred of tobacco out. I don't know that you need this fine detail about this or not. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we wanted. That guy brought us a pack of, of Kent. Now, I don't know if they make Kents anymore, but it's about that long <laughs> and, 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 and very thin. And, what it, 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 and, and, and back then, if, if, you had the, if you had the words uh, uh, yuppie uh, or something, that's what it would have been, a women's yuppie cigarette. They would do like that with it. And you would never get any tobacco out through that filter and so forth. Anyway, that's what he brought. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, with, with that night, I drank most of that beer with, with impunity, never thinking that I would be like my father. I, I drank it without a thought. I understand that's how uh, uh, um, you go back to drinking again, too, that it just sort of happens. And the book says you got to you got to do like that also and back off from it like it was a hot flame and so forth. But in any case, I went right to that beer just like um, with impunity. And I went to those cigarettes the same way. Uh, and, and, then, and then to top it all off, the four of us were in a women's haters club, uh, this little boys club in our neighborhood. It was about 12 of us. We had a tree house and, and uh, we had BB guns and, and things like that. We shot little birds and plucked them and cooked them and, and, and it, all the things that a boy does before he becomes a man and so forth. And I tell you what else we were doing uh, back then. We were thinking about the girls. We're 13 and 14. And um, I'm going to keep this as light as, and quick as I can as well. Uh, I, 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 I sometimes go into great detail about this when I'm talking in a prison to all men or something. But anyway, real quick, um, 
we had magazines. Now today, I guess you got the you got clubs and you got the internet and stuff like that. But back in the day, we're talking a long time ago. Um, they had magazines, and we I don't know where we got them, but we had them, and we looked at them, and we would say, uh, I've done that, and I've done this, and and, and we we've done nothing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lying, they're lying, I, they know I'm lying, I know they're lying, and, and, but, but, but we can't admit any of that. Now my real problem is, I'm, I'm the youngest of this group, uh, I don't know why, but I am, and I uh, was, and, um, and out of that original 12 group of guys of 12, uh, two of them died in Vietnam, Vietnam and, 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 and six of them died of alcoholism. Anyway, so I'm, I'm the youngest and I'm the poorest. We got nothing. I wear hand-me-down clothes. Uh, we got three sisters and one brother, and I wear more girl stuff than I do guy stuff. And that's the truth. And, uh, and uh, I didn't wear dresses, but you know stuff. Uh, didn't wear their underwear either, but, but coats and so forth. I would sometimes that would be my coat or something. But anyway, I also had a speech impediment. I would stutter and, and, and then, the, but the main thing is, I can admit this now that, that, that I have respectful fears even today that, that, that keeps me from walking out in the street or, 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 or hugging a lion or a bear or something or picking up snakes. Uh, but back then, I would tell you I had no fear, absolutely no fear. and and. and and, uh, and what it was is through AA and taking inventory and sponsorship, I found out that I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of you. I was so afraid of you that when I was in school, my school teachers couldn't get me to speak. They thought I was mute at, for a time and so forth. And, um, and I wouldn't speak to them. I, back then, the school teachers were almost always uh, ladies. And, and, and so forth. So I just, I was afraid of them. I just couldn't speak to them. And all the little girls, I just couldn't, I just couldn't. Now I wanted to, badly, but I just couldn't. I'd have to cross the street to stay away from them, I think. But anyway, that night, drinking most of that beer, smoking those cigarettes, I became a man. Um, that, 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 that's a fact. That, that's the feeling that came over me. The book talks about one of our problems is that we got a lack of power. It says that was our dilemma. Well, I'm here to tell you that, that for me, 13 years old, power came into this young boy's life for the first time through that six-pack of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. And I felt a sense of power. I became a leader of those other men those three boys. And, uh, and, and what's so profound about it all was we had one member of our little club, the Women's Haters Club, who was a girl. And uh, I could, I, I, we couldn't explain it back then. I can't explain it 20, uh, all these years later. I'm, the best I remember, she was a, a member of good standing. You know, I, I just don't know. And I'm afraid that sometime, I say this all the time, it's that I'm going to be at some AA meeting and tell this story, and some girl's going to come up here and just deck me, you know, for, for, for doing this. But anyway, I had my first experience with beer that night, smoking cigarettes that night, becoming a man that night, and with that lady, that girl. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the textbook, Alcoholics Anonymous, also, uh, long about the ninth step, has these things that we, we call the promises, uh, about um, nine or 10 or 12 things that they say will happen, and um, they're in the book. And uh, however, my sponsor told me the first promise for the book was we have recovered. And, and, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. But anyway, it, there's a part in that it says that we intuitively knew how to handle things uh, that we could not do before. And, I had that at age 13 with a six pack of um, Pat's Blue Ribbon beer. I knew that I would drink again that night. No doubt, it, it was not a question of that. It, it, was a, it was a matter of when, not if. I intuitively knew that this was the answer to this boy's problem and, 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 and that it became my solution. I'm one of us that had not alcohol came into my life 
if, ha if something hadn't come into my life more powerful than, than what was there and so forth, because I had no relationship with God or anything, if something hadn't taken over me, um, I'd have been one of those guys up in a watchtower killing people or something with a, with a high-powered rifle. I'd have done something because inside I'm full of fear of you, and I'm also full of anger and rage, and I didn't know that. Uh, long about the end of my drinking, I lived up on Lake Gaston, had a very heavily wooded lot. And, and I, I would get back up there and, at, at the end of the day, and I would get an uh, axe maul type thing and go out in the yard and, and split wood and had a fifth of uh, Jack Daniels with me and would drink and split wood. I had more woods. You couldn't... This lot where this church is is not big enough to have the wood that I had split up on my property. And, and what that was doing was helping me to get rid of that anger and, 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 and stuff, that, that rage that I had inside of me. And, and AA took it just like it was a, a, a drink of coffee, just took it away like through the steps. In any case, uh, I knew that I would drink again, and, and in fact, it, it dominated my life for the next 30 some years. I, I started when I was 13, came to AA when I was 42. Been here a little over 26 years now. So in any case, I, uh, little 13-year-old boys don't go live under the bridge, uh, not, not back there in that day and everything. So it, we still had to have people to buy it for us. And you had to drink when you could and if you could and how you could and things like that. And, and, but I would manage to, to get booze. I lost all interest in sports, lost all interest in school. And I tell you, I became a lying, a cheat, and a crook at the same time. I had little jobs, paper boy, working at the supermarket, being a bag boy and everything, and every dime I ever made came home and I gave it to my mother. Every dime. Um, that, that's that spiritual principle of, of tithing to God and so forth. That, that, I was no stranger to that. In fact, I tied 100% to my mother, and, and she would always give me 50 cents, 75 cents, or something back, all I needed to, to, to have a, a good time and so forth, uh, had I been living a right life and so forth. But anyway, my mom would take that money, and I wasn't the only good person in my family. My brother did that, my sisters did that, and that's how we kind of lived when my father was gone and so forth. So, when I started drinking, I needed that money, one, to buy the booze, buy the cigarettes, and, and to date those girls, and so forth. And I would lie to my mother. I'd say, Mother, I, um, we didn't get paid this week, or uh, I didn't work that many hours this week, or, or my bicycle needed new tires, and I had to buy new tires. And, and th I just started lying to my mother, the most, to, to, the, to the woman, to this day, that I have, I cherish the memory and, and love as, as good as I do, and did. And, and, I, and, and I had no guilt about that during that time period. Anyway, I drank on and so forth. I know, um, what are we closing, about an hour? Uh, so, okay. <laughs> I'm going to be respectful of the clock. So anyway, I just don't want to stay drunk the whole time either. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to talk about drinking a little bit because you need to drink to be an alcohol synonymous. I, I think that's what ought to be a, a mandate that, that everybody that gets behind this building, podium and so forth, to talk about drinking a little bit. That was my first drink and, and I'll, I'll just skip right on into like the last one. I, um, I'm, I'm now some, some 30 years later in, in a corporation, a major uh, corporation. Uh, I have gone up through the ranks, uh, some of that by merit, some of that by uh, uh, luck and, 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 and I guess give, it, give the glory to God. Uh, God just saw fit to, to, to take care of me. And um, I got the use of the corporate aircraft. Uh, we, our company owned uh, five planes and one helicopter and one hot air balloon. And um, <laughs> we, well, we used that for marketing and, 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 and that kind of, and promotions and so forth. But anyway, I went off on um, one of the newest planes. Uh, and didn't come back. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, I'm a blackout drinker. Uh, I go back to that first drink again. And um, so um, that night that I had that wonderful experience of drinking most of the beer, smoking most of the cigarettes, and that relationship with that young girl, um, I uh, went into a blackout that night. I didn't know that. 
Uh, I didn't know what a blackout was. I didn't know what a blackout was until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous 37 years later. I didn't know that what I did was not normal. And um, uh, I never talked about it to anybody, never asked anybody uh, about what's happening. In fact, I tried to hide that. I just acted like that was normal. In any case, I um, went into a blackout on that first drink and got in my first major trouble. Uh, and, and trouble and my drinking went together just like that. And um, not every time, but, but, but the, the serious stuff, that's the way it happened. In fact, if you look back on my inventory and everything, you would have to say, Paige, you must be an idiot that uh, not to have seen the, the, the correlation between your drinking and trouble. Uh, and, and, but I, I never could. I always defended my drinking and thinking my drinking was my solution. In any case, I got in trouble. I shot out all the windows of the National Guard Armory that night with my uh, BB gun. That was serious back then. It would be dead serious tonight uh, to, for some kid to do that. And uh, the next morning, I, um, I get awakened to that kind of noise. The police are at the, at the front door and, 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 and wanting to see me and my mom. And, and my dad happened to be home for some reason. And, and, uh, and, and so they got me and, and accused me of that. Had no defense. I, did, you know, I didn't know I had done that. Um, the, the, the other three guys said I had done that. Uh, I, I, I guess I'd done that, you know, <laughs> had no defense. Anyway, I got charged with it, and uh, my grandfather had to pay for that, and I had to work that off. I worked for my grandfather uh, at a service station for about three years to help, to help pay that back and, uh, and so forth. But in any case, got in trouble the very first time. My last time drinking, uh, same thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blackout drinker, and I'm um, I'm pretty good with um, keeping things. Uh, I don't I don't lose the keys. I don't lose credit card slips and, and, and things like that. Uh, I, I just stuff my pockets all the time. I still do. I go home at night and and, and, and figure out where I've been and what I've done, and um, type stuff. See, in any case, I uh, I went off on the company plane. Soon thereafter, it got explained to me the purpose of the plane was you go out and you come back. You go out and you come back. All, that's, that's, that's why they're good at what they do. They're fast. You, get, you go out and you come back. I got to drinking and couldn't come back and, uh, and, and so forth and didn't know I had to come back or go back. Anyway, um, so I got... Um, uh, um, I'm working, and in fact, I still work uh, as a, somewhat for these men um, for that company. Um, it had to be God. God uh, had put those men in my life, and those men loved me. And, and they had put up with my drinking for almost 20 years, and, and because it hadn't been, I guess, that serious or that major to them. But um, they... Um, they, they drew the line in the sand with that last, um, last deal and, um, and gave me the choice, said, Paige, you will, you will get help or you will walk home. And, and they don't mean that, uh, they meant that literally because all of us at that level, we're living on company expense accounts, we're driving company cars and, and that kind of stuff. And, and so what they meant was empty your pockets and, and walk home. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, uh, well, let me think about that. Have I got some time to think about it? And, um, and, and, and they did. They gave me three days to think about it. And, uh, and they said, but you've got to go see a man, and, and he's going to talk to you, and we're going we're gonna to go with what he says. If he says lock you up, fine. If he says let you go, fine. If he says you need help, and if you'll take it, we'll give it to you. And so, I, I, again, I, when I tell you I'm, a, I'm overpaid, I'm the most overpaid in this man in this room. I mean that financially and I mean that physically. I came to AA bleeding for both ends. I'd go to the bathroom, wouldn't know what to do, uh, but I'd be bleeding for both ends. Um, I'm a three pack a day uh, chain smoker, um, non filtered cigarettes. <laughs> and, um, and I, I'm drinking a quart of booze every day, and, and I rarely eat, uh, or if I do eat, it's at the bars, those eggs that are pickled and, 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 the, and those, those kind of things, and, uh, and I don't eat a lot of that. In any case, I'm in bad shape, and, um, and so um, I'm overpaid today physically, and I'm, I'm overpaid mentally. I know exactly what I'm doing here tonight. It's not what I want to do. It's what I'm supposed to do. And, um, 
and then I'm overpaid emotionally. You know, that uh, I, I get sad, I, I need to cry, I get happy, and, 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 and then I cry about that too. So and, you know, I'm, 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 just, I'm just overpaid. So in any case, um, I'm overpaid in that I had the best 12-step call in the world. And, I, and I, you know what? We don't have those that many anymore. Uh, real 12-step calls where a man sits down with another man and talks to him. Uh, many of you have done that. Some of you have got here by that means and method and everything. But it's, but it's not just like it used to be. And so, anyway, I had that experience. And, and the guy spoke to me for five hours. What, what I'm trying to cram into about one hour. I'm not going to make it. Um, <laughs> The, uh, he, he spoke to me for about five hours. He was a chain smoker even at that time, and uh, he offered me cigarettes, and I couldn't accept them because my hands shaking. I, I didn't have a drink that morning. First time in, in many years that I didn't have a morning drink. And, uh, and then uh, he's offering me coffee, and, and I couldn't take the coffee because uh, I'm shaking too bad. I'm shaking so bad I've got to now put my hands under my, under my thighs and sit on them so he won't notice. Every now and then, he would ask me a question, and I'd tell him a lie. And, and he knew it was a lie, I knew it was a lie, and, and so forth. He had a script. They had, the, the company had kept, been keeping a book on me and, and my escapades and everything, and they had turned it over to this guy, and he'd read it and so forth. I didn't know that for almost 20 years, and, 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 and he told me about it. Uh, I used to go sit on his porch about once a month, and we'd just talk. And, laughing, and joking, and everything, and he told me about that one time, about 20 years later. And I asked him, how did, how did you know I was lying every time? And he said, well, Paige, we had a book on you. So anyway, <laughs> I didn't know that. Anyway, he spent about five hours telling me about his life and, and what had happened and what his life is like now. He was a good member of AA then. He was for another 22 years. He's dead now, and, uh, and we gave him a, a great burial and, and funeral and, and so forth. But in any case, um, he, he told my employees that if I was not one, I'd do to one king, and, and, and which meant I was one. And, and, and so they said, Paige, we're going to offer you help, and, and, and you got three days to think about it. And um, I said, okay. And I went home. And I went home, and I'll tell you how powerful to me Alcoholics Anonymous is. I don't remember to this day what that man said. I, I've never ever been able to just sit down and start talking about it. And I know he talked about what we talk about. I just couldn't tell you what it is. I can tell you this though. I left there on the second step, the step of hope. I went there to that meeting hopeless. Hopeless. Suffering from a malady I didn't know I had. Um, and I left there with hope. Now, I don't say full of hope, but I left there with hope that, that, that something could happen. I saw him. I must have, I must have, uh, I understood what his life, I'll tell you what, 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 what set the hook for me. He had been a high-powered executive with General Motors, and he was with their international marketing team, and he flew their General Motors aircraft all over the world. He was down in South America and gave out a booze. And the country he was in didn't sell booze. He got on the plane and flew to another South American company, country and bought some booze and went back. And I understand that. That's perfectly normal, you know. And, and that set the hook for me. But I went home. I had a little girlfriend. The last little thing I had was this little girlfriend. And, and, uh, and about six months later, she came into AA2. She's a wonderful member today. But anyway, she was home, and she, and she wanted to know what was happening, and she fixed me a drink. I mean, that was automatic. That's just like going, we're going to have a drink. That's what we did, and, and so forth. And she fixed me a drink, and I sat down and started telling her uh, stuff. Uh, I don't remember what kind of stuff, but I was talking about what had happened and so forth. She got bored and got up, and she said, they're having a party next door. Are you coming? And I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm going to sit here. She said, do you want another drink? And the most surprising thing in the world was, no, I think I'll just sit here. And, and I turned down the first drink I can ever remember in my life ever turning down. And, uh, and I, I'm sitting there drinking one, 
but I didn't get the second one, and I did finish that first one. So three days later, I'm in my, in my bedroom, the same bedroom I'm going to go home to tonight. I live in the same home, little country place, and um, I, 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 I don't know that if I slept for three days, I don't know if I ate for three days, I don't know anything about that time period. I was like in a daze. I'm not drinking, I know that. And I got up the, 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 the morning of the third day, and when I got up, I fell to the floor. I got hardwood floors in, in my bedroom, and I fell down on that floor, and I could not get up, and I started crying. And I laid there, and I was crying. Now, guys, I'm not virtuous to any kind of pain in the world. I have violated every one of God's commandments, most of man's. I spent a couple years in the Southeast Asia. I've been in uh, nuclear submarine service. I've been in uh, world... Uh, world construction, uh, worldwide construction, and that heavy construction is what we called it. And so I, and I've done some of everything, and I've had every reason in the world to cry and to cry often. But my father beat the crying out of me when I was a kid. He just literally beat the crying out of me. He would say things like this, son, if you want to cry, I'll give you a reason to cry, and he, he would beat you uh, more. And soon you would learn not to cry, you know and so forth. I had every reason in the world to cry. Uh, and, and today, it's one of the most freeing, joyful expressions of, of, of my soul that I can do. Uh, tears of joy. When my brother-in-law died a, a couple months ago, I, I was asked to do part of that service. I cried during that service. Just couldn't go all the way through it and so forth. And, and so, so crying is okay. But my father has said, a man does not ask for help. A man does not cry. A man can do anything. And all three of those things are lies. Uh, and I taught my son that. I did not teach my grandchildren that. Uh, but, uh, but, and he didn't teach me those things to hurt me because he didn't love me. He taught me those things because he'd been taught those things. He believed those things. And they were just lies. So a man can cry. A man can't do everything. I'm good at what I do, but if you break your arm, you better see Wallace, you know. I can't, I, I can't help you, you know, can't help you. Um, so anyway, um, I, uh, I got up that morning, I fell on that floor, and I started crying. And uh, the most miraculous thing in the world happened. Um, I'm a God believer. I, I, I am a, I'm a, a, a sure enough born again uh, believing in God type person and, uh, and it happened for me a little over 26 years ago and I hope that, and I know that you're dependent you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't have a dependence on God but let me tell you something 26 years ago uh, uh, God left you and he was in my bedroom and he was with me and I said God help me I didn't ask God to help me off the floor I didn't ask God to help me with a drinking problem I didn't know I had. I didn't ask God to help me keep my job. I didn't know conditions. It was just God help me. Sometime after that, I got up and I was a new man. And, and, I, and, and that little girlfriend packed a bag for me and I went off to that treatment center and got locked up over there, got a wristband, uh, took my phone away, took my wallet away, took my razor away. Uh, took my booze away, uh, the whole bit and everything. And I hated it at first, and, and then, then it turned into a love affair. But in any case, uh, so God came to me when, 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 I, when I cried out for help. He, he absolutely, now I don't mean literally that nobody else went out without God, but the way it felt was he lifted me up and, and lifted me off the, the junk pile that I'd been living on and, and, and put me on the high road. And Now listen, I joke about this with some of the guys I sponsor, that he could have sent me to the Boy Scouts and I'd be somewhere tonight making a great Boy Scout talk about uh, be courteous and be kind and help little old ladies across the street and do those kind of things that Boy Scouts do. And, and, and I have been, been a leader of, the, of that organization and so forth. But he sent me to Alcoholics Anonymous. He's got Boy Scout leaders. He's got somebody to work with the cancer patients and so forth. He needed me. To, to recover and, 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 to, and to pay my dues by helping uh, uh, members of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and people that need Alcoholics Anonymous and, and to make me uniquely gifted to do that and, and giving me that sobriety and everything. 
Well, let me tell you what I did. I struggled with those steps. Um, I, I, I called myself a planner and a thinker and an intellectual and everything. I do have three degrees and, 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 um, and, 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 and none of them helped me get sober or stay sober. What, what, what I'm saying is, I, it took me about five years to figure out the little simple path that's laid out in this book that that, that that good doctor on his day off took that guy through in about four or five hours and everything. I, uh, I had good sponsorship. Every one of them were telling me what to do. Some of them were showing me how to do it. And, and, and I was resisting it and I was holding back. And I, I took fifth step after fifth step. I had great four steps, big, thick notebooks full of stuff and junk and stuff. And, but I was always lying a little bit. I was holding something back. And then the book talks about, and a good sponsor will tell you, is you've got to give it all. Uh, and you've got to tell it all. One man and God has got to hear it all. And finally, at year five, on my, on my anniversary date, year five, I'm in Coates, North Carolina, with, with five other members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we'd been down there for a big book study weekend. And we didn't call it a big book study weekend. We called it, we're going to take the steps over the weekend. And Don Fritz was leading us. And it was Don and Steve and Jerry and myself and um, Chuck and, and, and one other guy, uh, uh, and, uh, Jerry's uncle, and he's dead now, Larry. And, uh, and that's what we did. We, we, we started just like this book, and Don led us through that process and, uh, and set up four or five hours. It took us all weekend. And on, on Sunday afternoon, we were done. We were on the 12th step, and we cleaned that house up better than we found it, washed all the tiles and sheets and the plates and all that kind of stuff, and, and straightened everything. And, and we went to a meeting uh, from Coach to Dunn, and we didn't prearrange this. It was just worked out that way. God was involved in that. And I was to be the Sunday night speaker in Dunn. And we called that the group's 12th step. That's what we called it. Uh, only one of us could talk and so forth. And so that's what we did. And we didn't physically go out of that house uh, that weekend and go make amends. But we wrote out every single amend that we had to make. And, and, and through the sponsorship line that we had, got it organized. We figured out how we were, what we were going to do to make it right, not that we're sorry, but how to make it right and so forth and, and everything. And, and at, at year five, I gave God my, my, my life. I'd given him, I'm continuously sober since March the 31st, 1989. I gave him my alcoholism that, that date and time when I asked for help, but I had not given him my life. And when I put my life into, into the hands of AA and to the men and, and, and everything, and, and, and through that step application, I became a new man right then and there, a new creation, and, and, and been on, certainly been on the high road since then. So uh, Wallace, I think, introduced me by saying something about that I love AA or I like AA and I got an enthusiasm for AA. You bet I do. Who wouldn't to, to be on the life support system that I'm on? I just got back about three and a half weeks in Hawaii on an expense account. My company sent me over there. And, uh, and, and my brother said, Paige, when are you going to retire? And I said, well, you start paying for my trips to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll do that. But, but, but the, my, point, the, my point to that is the life support system or the life that I have with this design for living that's in AA, uh, uh, I, of course I'm enthusiastic about it and of course I'm so forth. And I'll tell you something else. I love AA. I'd, I'd love to do anything in it here. Hey, hey, put up all your tables, put out all the chairs, make the coffee, whatever, instead of doing this. But I realize this is part of it. Again, I want to thank you for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.